And welcome back to You Rejoin at 120. I am Jeff Click, and this is a series of 120 videos of things that I learned as part of a uh, Bachelor of Computer Science at the University of Virginia. And today we're going to be talking about Aristocles, uh, another one of the Greek philosophers that you probably have heard about, although you may not know it yet. Here. There we go. So I'm going to start with a quote. Uh, it's probably my favorite quote from him. Uh, which we'll get into where it's from and what it's about in a minute here. But, quote, There have been and will be again many destructions of mankind arising out of many causes. The greatest has been brought about by the agencies of fire and water and other lesser ones by innumerable other causes. There is a story which, uh, even as you have preserved, that once upon a time, Papion, a son of Helios, having yoked the steeds of his father's chariot, because he was able to drive them in the path of his father, burnt up all that was upon the earth, and was himself destroyed by a thunderbolt. Now this has the form of a myth, but really signifies a declination of the bodies moving in the heavens around the earth, and a great conflagration of things upon the earth, which recurs after long intervals. At, some t at such times, those who live upon the mountains, and in dry and lofty places are more liable to destruction than those who dwell by the rivers or on the seashore. And from this calamity of the Nile, uh, who is our never-failing savior, delivers and preserves us. When, on the other hand, the gods purge the earth with, with a deluge of water, the survivors in your country are herdsmen and shepherds who dwell on the mountains, but those who, like you, in cities are carried by the rivers into the seas. Whereas in this land, neither then or at any other time, does the water come down from on the fields, uh, or does the water come down from above on the fields, having always a tendency to come up from below, which for reason the traditions preserved here are the most ancient." Unquote. This is from the Critias, uh, or this is from Critias in uh, Aristarchus Timaeus, uh, findable uh, on the uh, Internet Classics Archive, which I can probably link here. But Aristocles uh, is, of course, otherwise known to the modern world as Plato, uh, which roughly means fat ass or fat zone or something like that. And it's kind of an amusing historical anachronism that we just happen to use Plato to describe him uh, in retrospect. Overall, though, his ideas are very powerful, and he's one of the more respected people throughout history and probably one of the more cited people uh, in history as well. And it may seem a little rude to, to us to refer to him as Plato, but don't forget, this is ancient Greece, and they have different social mores than we do, and part of the reason for that might be his ideas. Uh, and so Aristocles had a huge influence on the, practically everyone who came after him. Uh, in particular, his, his, one of his main influences is that on Christianity. Uh, realistically, you could view Christianity as uh, Plato's or Aristocles' uh, thought applied to Judaism or monotheism. And his ideas about love and the nature of the state in relation to love uh, would have been very persuasive to someone around, for example, Jesus' time. Uh, and you could certainly see uh, the, the kind of possibility for a religion to be constructed on those ideas from the perspective of a Jew. Uh, and so that would have been at least one explanation for what exactly Christianity was at the time. And of course, so th this kind of involves many different ideas. He, he approached many different topics uh, and would have been educated in many different things. Uh, but Platonic love uh, is certainly one of the things that even if you don't know anything about him as a philosopher, you've probably heard of. Uh, and we wouldn't understand the concept of Platonic love as at least as much we do without his kind of pointing it out and describing the different kinds of love and the different kind of ways that you could use and relate to it um, and kind of the importance of kinds of love that aren't just purely, for example, sexual. Uh, and he would not have argued that all we need is love, but he certainly would have been in favor of you having some in your life, especially for knowledge, wisdom, and true ideas. Uh, and possibly for the gods uh, as well. Of course, that would have changed to from the gods to, 
to God or to Jesus himself uh, with time and with the introduction of Christianity, but you can kind of get the, the kind of focus and um, kind of usability of a concept like that when you kind of imagine someone coming up with that there is this kind of way that you could be attached to things in the right way, that you could feel love for things in the right way uh, that are kind of informed by the way the universe is structured, etc. Et uh, he would have viewed, again, from many different topics and me many different things. In particular, I'm, I'm a musician, so I kind of have music close to my heart in a sense. Uh, and so he would have viewed painting, things like painting and music, not to be studied for amusement, but for the moral influence which it exerts upon you, and for the way that it changes the way that you express and experience emotion and feelings, and that you could kind of focus the way that you view the world by way of experiencing and learning about music itself. That idea right there, that you can not be fooled and cheated by people who use music just to, you know, kind of uh, inflare per particular emotions, if you have some experience in music yourself. And if you can kind of see and understand what the other musician is doing uh, to you, uh, that that might be a useful thing, not just for individuals, but for entire countries. This is a kind of way of approaching what music is and what emotion is so that you can, again, do the best with them uh, and become a decent person with their aid, which is going to be kind of a new idea at the time. He would have taught Aristotle uh, at his academy uh, that he, again, you know, he would have put together this school and this academy uh, and he would have uh, taught many people, including Aristotle. Uh, and that when Plato died, Aristotle returned to his native Macedonia, where he's supposed to, have, I guess, taught uh, Alexander the Great. And so, pretty much a, a, a student of his uh, is going and directly teaching the kind of greatest military ruler of his time, who then proceeded to conquer much of the world and instill his ideas and sow them everywhere so that they would spread and grow. Uh, he would have viewed ultimate reality, the unchanging thing, the thing that could be known uh, as only knowable through reason and reflection, not necessarily experiment. And that he would have kind of viewed this, you know, similar to Democritus, that there's this kind of unchanging feature of the universe, but that this kind of unchanging feature uh, is only understood through the mind, and that the mind is the only way to get at it. Diogenes criticized and embarrassed Plato publicly. Uh, he would have, among other people that he would have mocked, he would have mocked Plato. Uh, and that he would have disputed uh, that Plato understood the lessons from his teacher, Socrates. Uh, and he would have come to Plato's, or uh, yeah, even I can't keep the, the, the name Aristocles kind of straight in my mind a, a lot. I keep referring to him as Plato. It's so ingrained in me. But uh, he would have kind of gone to his lectures and m mocked him publicly in the lectures, disrupting the students as they're trying to learn, because they would have disagreed so strongly on so many things. Uh, and Diogenes hated him, and he thought that uh, another guy, uh, Antisthenes, uh, if I'm pronouncing that right, was the kind of true heir to the ideas that Aristocles claimed to be an, a hair too, which we'll get into when we get into the Socrates video. He would have claimed that Plato didn't understand virtue, which is, of course, uh, what Plato, er, Aristocles uh, was very much interested in instilling in people. Uh, since to Diogenes, uh, virtue meant indi indifference to wealth, uh, and it certainly didn't to him. Uh, Diogenes also didn't uh, kind of care for Plato's concern with ideas that couldn't be proved. Uh, so that there, there is these kind of view of ideas as abstract things that can only be understood in one's mind, uh, that they didn't have to be provable. They could be self-evident ideas. The idea of a god, for example, is not uh, usually something that you can prove. I mean, some people might disagree with me on this one, of course, but uh, the most, if not all of the proofs, uh, had not been invented by uh, Aristocles' time. And so you could view them, or something like that, 
as something that you just kind of take for granted and believe because it's right, not necessarily because you prove it. Same thing with the, uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of different uh, kind of self-justifying ideas. And, and as a result, Aristocles hated Democritus so much that he ended up wanting, or, or it, and Diogenes, uh, kind of, that he ended up wanting their books burned. Uh, and Democritus specifically, uh, per, I guess, per gave a view of the universe uh, that was too much of a leveler view, in a sense, because it meant that the atoms that uh, everyone was made of uh, were the same atoms whether you were a slave or whether you were a nobleman. And Aristocles would have had a huge problem with that, since he would have come from a noble family, uh, or at least kind of an upper class family, uh, and would have looked down upon uh, slaves and those uh, who were kind of down on their luck. And so Aristocles is one of the early book burners, uh, and one of the early ones who understood the value of books and what was in them, and to the extent that we uh, remember him as the victor of no kind of battles of knowledge uh, may in part be because he had a kind of keen understanding of what knowledge needed to be suppressed and how to do it. Again, because he was learned himself. Before him there may have been book burners, but there was very few book burners in history uh, up until his point uh, that would have understood you know, how to extinguish an idea or at least how important ideas can actually be. And in fact, Democritus's light was kind of extinguished, uh, in particular by his efforts. For thousands of years, we, until really Descartes, we really didn't have a, a sense of how important his ideas were. And he, he provided an intellectual justification uh, for uh, a social order and a, I guess, way of government that was very corrupt, uh, and a slave economy at that. Uh, Aristocles was comfortable being served by slaves and serving tyrants. Uh, however, he of course would have viewed tyrants as not a, uh, the best way of ordering a society, but he still would have not felt uncomfortable with them. And because of this, his view of what governments could be, how physics itself could work, uh, were quite possibly affected by this, because the, the mind-body problem uh, although De or Descartes would have kind of really clarified it and brought it to the surface, um, he was one of the main kind of causes of it. And his alienation from body, from mind, from thought, from matter, a lot of this dates to him. He was an elitist, and while he was in, uh, I, I guess he wrote uh, a lot of works, many of which were uh, are still available to this day and wrote, while entertaining uh, to the kind of average reader, uh, perhaps not entirely straightforward. Uh, it was assumed that you'd probably have a teacher or someone explaining it to you, uh, and so you would be expected to be smart enough to A, be able to read, which wasn't, you know, everyone wasn't able to read, and certainly everyone is still is not able to read Greek. Um, and two, that some of his language was a little bit clever, and so he was kind of doing some clever things with it. Now, thankfully, a lot of that has been translated, uh, and a lot of the nuance has been kept, uh, but at the same time, it is useful to have someone who is familiar with the greater scope of his ideas to help you if you do read or choose to read his works. But it's not to say that you can't get anything out of them if you don't have someone like that nearby. It's just that it's a little bit more valuable to have a teacher, to, to, to have a professor, uh, to, to experience the book in the context of the academy. And so he wrote dialogues. He wrote, you know, that, that was his style. He would, you know, examples of this are, going back to the Euthydemus video, uh, that was one of his works. Uh, and that he was using these dialogues to criticize his local society and to build ideas of what could possibly replace it. Uh, whether in the immediate future or in the long term, didn't matter. It was just kind of a, a way of viewing things of what could be. And pretty much everyone is in, or who was in Aristocles' dialogues uh, was a real person, although they were usually straw men of those real people, uh, to a large extent, uh, for him to kind of pr prove ideas or show ideas through. There's a mix of sarcasm 
and by stuff he's teaching you uh, just to get into the habit of learning. So, uh, you know, not everything that's in these dialogues is stuff that he wants you to believe. It's just stuff to get you on the right frame of mind so that you're ready to, to see what he would view as the eternal truths of how the universe works. And it's up to you, the reader, to kind of sort out which is which. So this is kind of a really kind of well thought through approach to learning at the time. Uh, it would have been kind of expecting the student to not just kind of passively sit and suck up everything from authority, but to actually start training their mind to get to into the habit of thinking, to get into the habit of, of approaching complicated problems by, again, the methods that he used uh, and kind of training them to, to reason correctly. According to some sources, a Proclus, um, Euclid's Elements was really just writing down what a bunch of Plato's or Aristocles' uh, students were working on, uh, with the main ideas in geometry, uh, which was being developed at the time, uh, and writing down clear definitions. Uh, these are things that he would have been in favor of. Up until his day, there were a lot of definitions of things floating around, and most of them kind of contradictory to each other. It was very difficult to get anything done in, w within the academic world because, uh, again, there were, there's so many different ways of viewing things, so many different ways of interpreting things, that there was no uh, kind of way to build on it. And so with geometry, at least, there was a kind of sense that you could simplify things down to their essential components and uh, that and Euclid, in fact, did write down kind of the basics of geometry and from there you could build more complicated things from it. Uh, and Aristocles would have argued that that should be done, that there should be a simplification of the things that are known so that you can you know, get the hard foundation of things to build on. So Euclid ended up actually doing that and Newton would have taken Euclid's work uh, and added the ability for things to change to it uh, and we are still kind of using that framework uh, of what mathematics means and how it can be used that re realistically dates to his demand that we are clear about what we're doing, we use clear definitions, we state what we assume when we deal with things, we kind of build from these axioms uh, and kind of work in that direction. And so he, he's an author, he's, he's trying to, to force the, the reader and the, the thinkers of his time to think clearly, uh, and he's you know, an author, he, he's, he's interested in teaching people uh, who are interested in learning. So uh, if, if you're watching this video, go read uh, the Apology. Go read you know, Plato's or Aristocles' Apology. Uh, that, that's it's a short thing, it's not that long, it'll put you in the right frame of mind for uh, one of the next videos. Um, it's, it's worth going out and actually trying to read some of this stuff. It's not that long. You know, he would have put a lot of work into writing it, uh, but to the modern eye, it's, it's really not that long. So, go do that. Um, he would have also introduced the idea that it's worse to injure your soul. He would have viewed things in terms of souls. Uh, but it's worse to injure yourself and your soul by committing evil than it is to suffer that evil from another's hands. Uh, that that was pretty much his one of his ideas, and so he was, or at least he was the one of the first to write it down. And again, th this is not, uh, at least to my knowledge, uh, kind of something that you would have associated with the Judaism or the ancient Greek religions of his time. That the idea that you could kind of hurt yourself and cause yourself to be, you know, have this absolute ability to screw your own self up, this kind of immortal part of you, uh, to condemn yourself to no longer being a, you know, decent person, uh, which is, a, again, kind of this horrible, horrible thing, uh, that you could do this. Now, there wasn't this eternal hell that you would have been condemned to, but at the same time, you're condemning yourself. You're causing, by your choice, by your ignorance, or yourself and the properties of yourself to be affected in a completely negative way. And this would have been kind of steps towards what we would consider to be a modern Christian view of kind of condemning yourself to hell for sin or whatever. He would have viewed 
the universe, not in terms of atoms necessarily, uh, but in terms of these things called forms. And forms are a little bit hard to describe, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to kind of get across the basic idea. Uh, and to that there is this, I guess, per constant change in the, the, in the world around us, that we have you know, human beings and animals and you know, sponges and plants and all these things. Uh, but there, there's this thing that all of them kind of share in common, that there's this life or that there's you know, the, the different properties of human beings that they can have, different virtues, uh, different um, shapes, different uh, you know, governments of all kinds share certain properties. And at, at all times, they're kind of gaining and losing uh, the, these properties that they share with each other. And you can learn about these properties and you can describe them. Um, and that, in his view, that there is this kind of maybe a place, you could view it as heaven or something like that, where these forms exist and that we partake in them or we, we share in their existence uh, to greater or lesser degrees. Maybe we choose them, maybe we don't. Uh, but everything from you know the, the, these markers, these whiteboards, everything, you know, this shares the form of a whiteboard. Somebody thought of a whiteboard and then made the whiteboard. And so this this idea of a whiteboard informed this whiteboard's ex existence and kind of caused it to come into being. And we can get into the types of causes that Aristotle would have uh, described after thinking about these these kinds of ways of viewing it. But again, that there's a, that there's this kind of place with it, this this set of ideas to choose from, these ideas called forms, and then depending or not whether you are kind of taking part in that particular idea a lot or a little bit, uh, will kind of depend what you look like, depend what how you act, depending you know whether something is beautiful or not. You know, beauty itself would have been a form, would have been you know something that you can partake in. Uh, if maybe if you're lucky, maybe if you work at it, whatever. Uh, but that there's this thing that is out there that you can perceive if you think about it, that you can train yourself to see, that you can train yourself to understand its nature, that you can train yourself to reproduce, uh, that all of these things, again, relate to this ideal, this thing that this perfect representation that maybe is not necessarily possible to have in an absolute form in the flesh, but it's possible to consider, that it's possible to have this, this perception of what things could be. And that knowledge, in his view, was understanding and perceiving of these forms and understanding how they work and studying the forms themselves, not necessarily the implementations of those forms. You know, if you're viewing things in terms of Java programming or object-oriented programming, you know, the form would be the most general superclass uh, that is kind of uh, worth describing. So the object would be a form in, in kind of his language. Aristotle was against Plato's idea of the form because he would have viewed uh, a couple of problems. Um, one kind of dating to how he viewed causes. Um, one dealing with the difficulty of describing how participation in those forms works. And also uh, what he called the middleman project or, or the third man or third man or middleman the criticism where you have like the form of a square and then you know your real square uh, which is close to a square you kind of view it as a square and then is this part taking in the square or kind of a middle uh, man that is kind of this square like thing etc so it wasn't really clear exactly how to describe that in a consistent way even in Plato's time but he certainly made an attempt to try uh, to describe it uh, he would have viewed pleasure and things that give pleasure as usually vices and bad things. Again, kind of looking at this in terms of a fundamentalist Christian perspective, this is exactly the, the kind of place where this kind of idea would have come from. The idea that if you add spices to food, that you're basically wasting money, that you're basically wasting you know, your life by not using that funds to, to get knowledge about the forms, uh, that you're just instead you know, pleasing yourself. And that yes, you know, some vice is going to happen in your life, but that you can minimize it and you can reduce it and spend your life, you know, thinking, spend your life attached to philosophy, attached to reasoning. That was his kind of world, the perfect world for the perfect person. Maybe not everyone would partake in that particular type of life, 
but he would have certainly looked down on the people who didn't. Um, going back to the forest versus trees video, Plato was a very forest guy. Uh, he would have viewed things in terms of high level descriptions, again, which are kind of closer to what he would have viewed as forms. Uh, going, you know, looking at the uh, things from the Lisp perspective, the Lisp programming language. Uh, Lisp is platonic in, in this sense. You design from the perspective of the forests. You don't have to care about how Lisp implements your design on the bit level uh, most of the time. You just have to care that the high level things that you're describing are actually happening. He was also around close enough to the invention of writing and close enough to the introduction of writing to his particular local uh, village uh, that it was still a new thing and that reading rather than thinking and oral history rather than writing uh, was still kind of an open issue to his day. And he would have been skeptical of writing itself uh, as something that was kind of good for you as a thinking person. Uh, and th even though he wrote many books, uh, he certainly criticized the idea that we were doing a good thing by writing things down. Because the people who weren't using their brain to store the oral histories and weren't continually rehashing the oral histories of their time were starting to lose some of their long-term memory, some of their short-term memory. And you could tell that they weren't quite as sharp uh, in practice as you know, they, they, their forefathers at least seem to be. Uh, and even though with written material you can have a whole library of stuff, and in fact I'm in a library right now filled with knowledge, and if I want knowledge on a particular subject, I can go to that book, I can read about that subject and be informed on it very quickly, whereas that wasn't possible with oral histories. With oral histories there was more knowledge available immediately and, and from the wise people of the tribe or whatever, but there was these kind of very uh, low limits on the, the possibility of knowledge. And so he may not have seen this yet because writing had not progressed to the point where it was significantly beyond the oral history stage at that point, at least for the, the what he would have viewed as important topics. Um, as Vin mentioned in the Vint Cerf video, uh, Vint Cerf noticed something very similar about uh, computers uh, in regards to written on paper uh, books and newspapers or whatever, uh, and that there's, at least in Vince Cerf's day, which includes today, uh, many people who view computers and the internet in the same way that people viewed, or that uh, Aristocles viewed spoken you know, thought in his day, uh, that there is this worry that people will neglect encyclopedias and written knowledge uh, from you know, the people, for example, in Paulia and Dewey's day that put a lot of work into kind of encoding what humanity knew on paper, um, that we'll just kind of forget that as we you know, continue to live more and more live of our lives mediated by these computers. Uh, the worry, again, is the same worry that he would have had, and a lot of the arguments are the same arguments, and we can kind of view them as justified or not so justified, depending how closely to the form of knowledge or perfect knowledge we want to share with them. Uh, apparently the first instance of proof by induction uh, was in Aristotle's work Parmenides, uh, so that's kind of worth noting. Newton would have had access to Aristotle's works and would have read them. I personally have read, uh, I think almost all of them, I think there's one or two that has kind of eluded my grasp, uh, that I don't think they were available on that Plato Stanford uh, website, but uh, most of them I've read. The Republic, specifically, I've read uh, almost like a dozen times. But it has been quite a few years since I've read them. In some cases, up to even, I think, 12 years ago. So he would have also, uh, and, and as, as kind of mentioned in the Republic, or the, you know, he wrote this Republic book. And so that what in the modern day, we in, in the United States, we have these kind of two factions, these two kind of self-referential uh, cultures, the culture of uh, Democrats and democracy and the culture of Republicans and Republicanism. And so uh, I, I know a lot of people are kind of looked down on the Republican side, but it's important to note that this tr 
tradition of viewing a republic as imperfect government, uh, as hilarious as that sounds, uh, dates back a lot longer than the clowns like Donald Trump, who are currently kind of using the word today. Uh, and that the people who created the United States it would have read Aristocles' views and would have kind of grappled with them and tried to argue with each other about them and tried to come to a conclusion of how to implement them uh, in such a way that you know, wouldn't be completely ignorant of the thousands of years of experience before them and after Aristocles. Uh, and that there, this tradition of trying to build a perfect country, or at least if it can't be perfect, a country that's superior to a democracy. And when I say democracy, I mean as a democracy happens in practice, not this ideal of a perfect democracy. You know, Plato even might have been a little bit okay with a perfect democracy, but he would have known that in practice it isn't perfect. You know, we have the Democrat Party, which, you know, in this day and age, is fully willing to kill people without trial, to you know, kidnap and torture them without trial, uh, and to torture even in the presence of a courtroom, which is kind of a new thing. You, know, you have to go hundreds of years back to you know, see that. But even then, you know, over the centuries, democracies have done some pretty screwed up things. And so when we want to think about what a government can be, and if we're going to live with other people, how that society is going to be structured, uh, that you know, we have to admit that democracy as an idea uh, isn't always implemented perfectly. And I mean, there are issues that not only come around in general with it, but in our specific democracies that we live in, that there are problems. And there was corruption, there was uh, demagoguery, there was you know, propaganda uh, and kind of lies uh, and you know, centralization of power to people who really didn't deserve it, uh, like, for example, Stephen Harper. And you know, th th this isn't just an issue of this past 10 years that we're finally just getting over. You know, th this, this issue of uh, corruption and centralization of power and censorship and all these things, uh, these issues go right back to the ancient Greeks and their experiences with mob violence and uh, corruption in their democracies. And, you know, when we think about all the, the, the reserves here in Canada that didn't get uh, a you know, have their people have a chance to vote. Uh, again, going back to the First Nations video and the Great White Combine video, you know, because they ran out of ballots in this, this particular election. You know, the, e even, you know, those sorts of things, they also go all the way back. In ancient Greece, there was a huge percentage of the ancient Greeks who were not allowed to vote. Women were not allowed to vote. Young people, uh, slaves, all sorts of non-property classes, pretty much everyone other than their, you know, just rich men. Uh, were, were not allowed to vote, and even not all rich men were allowed to vote. So there's just this small percentage of, of all the people who could vote were deciding the, the, the laws and the nature of their government. And not, not only were they deciding the laws, but a lot of these people weren't even literate. Uh, they weren't even aware of what their country was doing. They didn't have any sense of history. They were just doing for you know, whatever was popular. And all of these things continue to happen to a lesser and greater degree. Uh, this is not to say that, of course, democracy isn't worth doing, but it's, you have to admit there are problems. There are problems with some of the people who vote, and there are problems with even myself. I'm not a perfect voter. I wouldn't pretend to be a perfect voter. I, I think that I understand a lot of things, but again, I, I'm not an expert on political science uh, by any stretch of the imagination. And so uh, a government that kind of draws all of these flaws, can we do better? Could we think of a government that could do better? And given that it had never been tried uh, up until Aristocles is kind of trying to describe the idea, um, he, he came up with a way of viewing the things that democracy had accomplished and the, the cultural ways of that, or the cultural practices that came along with democracy uh, in light of a more centralized government. And so it was a persuasive attempt. It captivated minds for centuries, uh, minds including fascists and racists and slavers, but minds no nevertheless. So he would have held the ruling class to a higher standard of morality, as opposed to just whoever tribe was most militarily successful, or the above average skill on the battlefield of whatever you know English guy happens to be on the or woman in this case happens to be on the throne. Um, 
and this is, doesn't just apply to governments, because it also, in the 21st century, we spend a lot of our time online, and a lot of our time is kind of inside of these kind of scopes of organized uh, behavior and organized discussion that looks very much like a government when you start thinking about it. These, these forums, these subreddits, these you know, places where uh, people are and can be excluded from if they don't abide by the rules set out by the community on some level. And so the idea of hiring virtuous, disinterested moderators for a, a forum, this is going to be something that's very close to how he would have approached you know, his government, that there should be this class of people that is kind of spe special in a sense and treated special and not not even necessarily not allowed to do you know the, the pleasurable things in life but at least ex where more is expected of them than just your average person uh, and so those sorts of things that uh, you know kind of separating the the, 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 the the country into these you know classes of people where each class has a particular role to play you know, we don't like to think of things in those terms where you're kind of stuck in a case or stuck in a class or something like that. But Greek society was already split among those lines. And the problem was is that those classes didn't end up uh, kind of working together uh, as nearly as much as they could have. So the, the problem of class society was one that he was faced with. He did, you know, the best he could with it. Obviously, we could do different things with it. But the way he approached class societies uh, hierarchies in societies, what government can be, was extremely persuasive. Uh, Cap, again, if you want to think about political science, and if you want to understand what Republicans are trying historically, not even in the, in the current context, but historically have tried to do, you can do, you know, the place to start is his republic. Go and read it. It's a, it's a little bit longer than the apology. Uh, but again, it's, it's a surprisingly modern read if you consider the kind of darkness uh, and you know, insanity inherent in their kind of way that they treated their society at the time. So, in, in general, you, as you can see, I, 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 I could probably keep going on and on and on about him and his ideas and his works. I think I've got like a 300 meg file that I'm trying, to, still trying to get through. I'm pretty much given up on getting through at this point. Uh, but this is someone who has kind of laid the foundation for Western civilization. Uh, and you, if you want to understand how religion has changed the world, how the, the, the Westphalia system, how the, the monarchies of the, you know, all, all sorts of centuries in the past have kind of viewed themselves. Learned people read his books. Learned people understood his ideas argued using his language, uh, if not, you know, Greek itself. Um, and so that this is someone who has defined the playing field for thousands of years after uh, you know, he, he kind of wrote down his thoughts. Uh, he isn't right on everything. He may not even be right on very much. Uh, but if, if you're going to try to talk to other people, you will notice that sometimes they will come up with his ideas in practice. And it's worth knowing that where they come from, when they do, so that if, if, even if they're not right, or even if they are, that you can kind of appreciate where they come from, uh, it's worth doing that. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about him when we get to the Socrates video, uh, because he was one of Socrates' students, so kind of look forward to that. Uh, and since uh, we're kind of over time already, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to field them. You know, go read his stuff. It's, again, it's, it's not long. Go, go out and read it. Um, and come back with some questions, because I'd love to field some questions on this guy. I spent a huge chunk of my life you know, reading his work, works, even if it was a while ago. So you know, go out and uh, go do that. Uh, and when you're done, uh, send me some Bitcoin so I can continue this uh, video series, because I can definitely use it. And uh, I will see you next video.